Welcome back, everybody. Well, when I was a kid, a prenuptial agreement was something for the rich and famous. But these days, more and more millennials are demanding them before they say, I do. And here to explain why is family lawyer Diana Isaac. Welcome to the show, Diana. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And a lot of people think, you know, that, that uh, that's a very bad word, the prenup. But what exactly does a prenup? Um, well, a prenuptial agreement really refers to a marriage contract. In Canada, that's how we define it. And really what it is, it's a written agreement between parties that are really contemplating marriage. And it outlines how you're going to deal with legal issues when there's a dissolution of marriage. And certain terms I've seen in these marriage contracts would include things like, how do we opt out of property division? Or how are we able to uh, not have support obligations? And more and more, we're seeing that prenups are becoming very prevalent. Really? Oh, really? Absolutely. Absolutely. So who needs a prenup? Does everyone need a prenup? I think that's a really fascinating question. A lot of people do ask this. And traditionally, it's about people that are high income earners or potentially can earn a lot, mm -hmm. or they have significant assets. But now I'm noticing that there are people that are entering into, let's say, their second or their third marriage, and they want to preserve what financial mm. security or integrity sure. they have left, yeah. and they're saying, I need a prenup. And also, given the current real estate market, I'm noticing a lot of adult children that are coming to our office and saying, you know what, Diana, my parents want to gift me a down payment, a significant one that's going to go into the matrimonial home. Mm -hmm. So how do I go about protecting that in a situation where we don't work out and we're going to separate? Yeah. Yeah. So they need, a, they need a marriage contract. It's important. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more and more, we're noticing with millennials, they're getting married at a later time in life, which sure. means yeah. they've accrued a lot more assets. Yeah. Yeah. And they want to protect that. Yeah. I mean, in 1972, the average age for a Canadian male to get married was around 25. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're, you're still yeah. a kid now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And for females, it was 23. In 2016, mm -hmm. we've noticed that the average for the marrying age for a male, a Canadian male, is now 31. Uh, and for a female, it's around 28. So there's a radical change. And by that time, you probably, 20. And by that time, you probably <laughs> bought your first property. Right. Yes. Right? You yeah. paid off your debt. You have yeah. some assets we by, that, by that. that age. We see oh, that yeah, quite yeah. a bit. I feel young now, babe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. Now, what about common law couples? Is this something they should consider getting a prenup? Well, I think, first of all, it's important that we understand what does a common law couple mean? How do we define that? And according to legislation, a common law couple is basically two persons that are not, obviously not married, and they've continuously cohabitated for at least three years. Mm -hmm. Or they have a child together, and there's some sort of relationship of some permanence. Okay. So in that situation, People have come up to us, and I obviously have helped individuals that are in common law relationships, and they're seeking what we call a cohabitation agreement, mm. which really functions right. like a marriage contract for people that are not married. Wow, okay. So if you're in a, in a relationship, then when should a, a prenup conversation happen? You know what I mean? Like right. a year, you're kind of dating, it's been, hey, you know, guess what? <laughs> Very romantic. How about, how about a prenup? Yeah. Very romantic. That'll get you the third date for <laughs> right? sure. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That'll get you something, Stephen, yeah. the third date. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I would say, is it proper for us to talk about a marriage contract on the eve of the wedding? Probably not. It doesn't make for a great honeymoon. Well, that, yeah, that's right. the thing. You yeah. always hear that. You know, it's like, yeah. Right. The night of. It's the like, night really? of. Because they're leaving it to the last minute. Yeah. Is that because it's an uncomfortable conversation? Is that why? It's awkward. And also has, it also has legal implications. You do not want your spouse to allege that they were under duress mm. when they were trying to sign this agreement. Mm. And then, I mean, in situations I've been asked, well, what about the first date? Now, I think that's a little premature. <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> right? Say, that's yeah. too much. <laughs> She's going to shut right. down. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if you really sit down and think about this person and say, do I intend to be with, is this the person that I want to marry? Mm. And I think if that's the situation, then it's probably safe to say it warrants that discussion of the marriage contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, should a couple draft their own pre um, prenuptial agreement contract, or should they go see a lawyer? Well, seeing as you're asking a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Not being subjective here, but I think, you know, I don't, you can definitely do your own marriage contract. Do I recommend it? 
I don't. No. And the reason being is a lot of people that come into my office say, oh my God, Diana, I've entered into what we call a kitchen sink agreement. Now I realize that this agreement is not in my best interest. What are my options? And I sit there and say, well, number one, it's difficult to set aside these type agreements. Number two, it's going to be very costly. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, there's no assurance that a judge would set aside such agreements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's better that you at least incur the short-term cost and I do believe that there are long-term savings. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's not forget, in 1989, Steven Spielberg paid $100 million, U.S. dollars, may I add, to actress Amy Irving for their prenup that a judge had invalidated because it was a prenup that was drafted on a cocktail napkin. Dude. I know, but wait, he does, he kind of, wait a second, he kind of deserves that. If you have that kind of money to lose, why are you writing your prenup on, on a, a napkin? napkin. You can afford a lawyer. I only have $10 <laughs> in my savings account, and trust me, it's going to be on some kind of legal paper, right? And this was a four-year marriage, so this is why I always emphasize it's important to yeah. at yeah. least yeah. speak to a lawyer about that. That's yeah. $25 million a year. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Think of that. That's oh. a lot of money. Gosh. All right. Oh, well, thank yeah, you so much, yeah. Diana. Now, after the break, Diana is going to reveal the most common divorce questions she's ever been asked. Don't go away. No content. No content. No content. No. It's not always the case of till death do us part. In fact, StatsCan reports 43% of marriages actually end in divorce. Mm. Now, family lawyer Diana Isaac is here with answers to her most frequently asked questions. Questions. Okay, so you've decided with your partner that you want to get a divorce. What's the first step? What do you do? I think that you have to have a candid discussion mm -hmm. about how you want to deal with the legal issues, with property division, mm -hmm. when you're talking about custody and parenting issues. These are very yeah. fragile um, issues, of course, because a lot of people say, my children are not up for negotiation. And mm -hmm. so everyone needs to focus on what's in the best interest of the children. Right, wow. Now, should you let your spouse know that you're filing, or do you keep it a secret? Well, I think it depends. <laughs> all the women, oh. all the women oh, are in the audience I, are like, mm -hmm. uh -huh. don't let him know, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the circumstances. I have some clients that tell me, you know, before you send out that introductory letter saying that you've been hired to represent me, let me have that preliminary discussion with my spouse. Because if they get this letter from a lawyer, mm. they may be very upset, sure. they may be shocked. Okay. So sometimes it just makes sense to open that path or create a path of an amicable resolution by them having that discussion. Right, so it's saying, I'm thinking about getting a divorce, what do you think? And then have you... <laughs> <laughs> So, Karen, I got my lawyer Never on. mind the prenup. Yeah. How do you bring oh, that up? Not a good idea. No. <laughs> okay, so we wanted to get into the three most common questions that you get. And, and the first one is, if my spouse cheated on me, why do I have to pay spousal support to them? This is a difficult discussion to yeah. have with a client mm. because some clients cannot reconcile this moral aspect of infidelity with how we determine entitlement for spousal support. I mean, the way we determine spousal support, the factors don't consider blameworthy conduct. So we're looking at how do we financially help this spouse that is now separating because they probably had a particular role or contribution in the marriage. So how do we provide them with economical respite or self-sufficiency mm -hmm. as a result of the breakdown. So very different factors that really don't contemplate this type of wrongdoing morally. Could you put uh, like yeah. a clause? Like an infidelity clause? Not in that your, I would be interested. In your prenup? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not enforceable. No. So, I mean, I think it's important oh. that a lawyer speaks to their client and says, you know, what are your goals? What are the intentions of this marriage contract? And if the intention is, I don't want to pay spousal support, or I want to restrict the amount of spousal support I'm going to be paying, mm -hmm. then you should clearly and succinctly put that into an agreement without these contingencies or conditions, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the next question you get asked a lot is, do I need to divide my pension when I get divorced? Oh. Yes. A lot of people say no. Yes. Yes. You do yes. have to divide you your pension. Well, when you are married, there is a property d regime that is referred to as equalization of net family properties. And that technical oh. term, really, the philosophy behind that is that what you've accrued during the marriage, which would include your pension, mm -hmm. is generally subject to division when there's a separation. So that is a very common mm. question where people are shocked with the answer. Wow. Uh, this next question here, um, how long will it take to resolve a divorce? Oh, yeah. 
Uh, that right? that, that I get a lot. I yeah. Like, I get that question a lot. And I always tell clients, it really depends on the parties. I mean, if we're dealing with a matter where the parties are more amicable, mm. then we probably will have a more expeditious resolution. Now, if they're more acrimonious and there's high conflict and they're fighting about a table lamp, mm. then we're, we're yeah. going to be extending this conflict. And the most important thing is, are we in court or are we negotiating? If we're negotiating, then we can control the process. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to court, now the process is dictated by court availability, which typically takes longer. And it draws it out and it gets oh. more expensive, it right? Does. It, it does. does. Yes. It does. Awful. So are there ways to speed up a divorce process if you commit to it? Yes, what I call a happy divorce. I think that, you know, some tips would be try not to have an emotional divorce. So let's try to avoid the mudslinging. Let's, yeah. you know, put our differences aside. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> it's a nice idea. Conceptually, yeah. sometimes it's uh, hard, and, yeah. and I, I completely appreciate that. I think it's important that parties have their disclosure organized, because in order to have settlement, you have to provide full disclosure. I think yeah. that also people have a tendency to involve third parties like their family yeah, and their yeah. friends, and that really compounds issues. And gets messy. It oh. does. Thank you so much, Diana. So much great information. Very enlightening. Now, when we come back, it's the battle of the old school and the new cool gadget. Will it tear the house of the goods apart? Find out after the break.